do you overcome fear, anxiety, and worry? You might be here tonight relatively new to this whole vibe, and you're catching feels. You're like, I like this. I love the, I love the chill, fun, enthusiastic atmosphere. But how do I live that way? How do I live that way? Like, how do I overcome anxiety, fear, and worry? Did you know that there are at the very least 145, everyone say 145, references in the Bible to fear, anxiety, and worry. So at the very least, there are 145 references in the Bible to fear, anxiety, and worry. And we're going to really tackle uh, one of the main ones tonight. Here's the reality that you have to understand. Fear is a liar. Fear is sneaky. It tries to make you think it's reality. And C.S. Lewis wisely said, both proverbially, metaphorically, and physically, and biologically, you can't see anything clearly when your eyes are blurred by tears. And if you're trying to get a proper view of the world, you've got to remove the tears, the fears, the anxieties, the worries, the sorrows, and the sadness. The Bible says in the Ecclesiastes, therefore, remove all sorrow from your heart. The truth of the matter is your, your emotions and your feelings can lie to you. I don't know if you're aware of that, but your feelings are not always trustworthy. Your emotions are not always reliable. Antonio Damasio, a famous neuroscientist, once said that our feelings decide for us 95% of the time. That's huge. I'm glad you caught that. 95% of the time, our feelings decide for us. So how do we keep our feelings from deciding our fate? How do we keep our choices um, determining a better destiny, not based on or contingent or predicated upon our feelings, because our feelings are often bad guides. They're compasses that have gone askew. Doesn't always lead us in the right direction. How do we keep our fear, anxiety, and worry from leading us in the totally diametrically opposed direction that God intended us to go in to reach our destiny? Let's look at Luke chapter 12 to find the answer to this. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 6. Jesus says, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. We'll stop there and then we'll keep reading for a while. But take a look at uh, what Jesus says. Why should you not fear? Because he gives us two reasons here, first and foremost. He says, we're of more value than many sparrows. And he also says, the hairs of your head are numbered. So this is sort of his didactic, uh, a posteriori, a priori apology and logic for why you shouldn't fear, why you shouldn't be anxious. He says, do not fear, therefore, why? Because you are of more value than many sparrows. They're sold for money and coins and cash. You're of more value than many sparrows. And yet... He also gives a second reason why we should not fear. He says the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now, why does that, why does that help us not fear? And then we'll keep reading in just a moment. Firstly, let's take a look at do not fear, your hairs are numbered. Here's what's fascinating. The Old Testament shows the cosmic, and the New Testament shows the microscopic in regards to God's care for his creation. Here's what I mean. In Isaiah and Psalms, in the Old Testament... We see God's infinite power in regards to creating galaxies. We saw this a few weeks ago. He created the very stars with his fingers. We see his infinite power in the old, but watch this. We see his intimate pity in the new. So we see his infinite power in that the Bible says in Isaiah and Psalms, he names the stars. He calls out the stars by name and he numbers the stars. Infinite power. Do you know how hard it is to name and number the stars? Like Antares, Canis Majoris, Epsilon, G2 Dwarf, Alpha Centauri. As he's naming the stars, Canis Majoris, this is big stuff. There are so many stars in space that, as I like to say, 6,000 stars visible to the naked eye, more than 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the current estimate is 2 trillion galaxies. That's a lot of stars. And the Bible says God calls them forth by name. He's like a shepherd of stars. He's like a star herder. What a sick word. I just thought of that. A star herder. He like herds the stars. He calls them by name. This star herder, this star shepherd. He counts the stars and he knows them by name. That's the old, infinite power. But in the new, we see his intimate pity. 
and that he cares for us so much so that the same God who, according to Psalms and Isaiah, counts the stars and calls them forth by name, Jesus says, the good shepherd, this is from John 10, knows his sheep by name, and the sheep hear his voice and listen. So the same God who knows the names of the stars, he also knows your name. Now, I'm not the best with names. I get Namesheimers. I believe Molly, Margaret, Macy, Manda called into our show earlier. How close was I if you're here? Okay, there's an eerie silence. That's why we call it cricket comedy, crickets. Anyways, I'm not good with remembering names. I wish I was better at that. I get Namesheimers. Is this thing on? That was a joke. Okay, the crickets keep coming. So watch this. I get Namesheimers, I sometimes forget. But you know what? The Lord is so good that he remembers every one of your names. John 10, he knows his sheep by name. He, watch this, he, he, the sheep hear his voice and listen, he knows your name, but watch. Not only does God count the stars in the old, uh, pardon me, name the stars, call the stars forth by their name in the old, but in the New Testament, he calls his sheep by name, but also in the old, he counts the stars. The book of Psalms teaches he breathes the stars into existence. When's the last time you breathed the star into existence? When's the last time you yawned and a star popped out? That's what God can do. So God breathes stars into existence and he, he counts them. He counts the number of the stars, Old Testament. In the new, he counts the hairs on your head. That's our text right now, Luke chapter 12. So in the old, he numbers the stars. In the new, he numbers your hairs. In the old, he calls forth the stars by name. In the new, he knows his sheep by name. In the old, it shows his infinite power. In the new, it shows his intimate pity. Both are true. But how cool is this? This is what intimacy is. It's into me see. That's the phonetic sort of onomatopoeia. Into me see. Intimacy. He sees into me and yet he loves me just the same. My secret parts are not hidden from him. He knit me together in my mother's womb, Psalm 139 says. He knows me so intricately and so intimately that he would count the hairs on my head. Listen, God is really obsessed with you. Malachi 3.17 says you're his jewel. You are his pearl of great price. He really loves you. Why should you not fear? Because the God who is powerful enough to count stars takes the time to count your hairs. Does that somehow take away a little bit of your worry? Does that somehow make you a little less afraid, feeling a little more safe? Doesn't that make you a more non-anxious presence in the world to realize that the divine is on your side and that ultimate reality is taking time to count your hairs? Not just infinite power, but intimate pity. He has compassion on you, empathy toward you. He cares for you. So that's why Jesus says, don't fear. This is how intimate God is in his care for you. But secondly, notice what he also says in our text. He says, you're of more value than many sparrows. That's specifically what he uses, the word value. That's the etymology that he employs and deploys. Everyone say, value. value. He values you. Everyone say, God values me. God. He says, you're of more value than many sparrows. Not one of the sparrows is forgotten by God. And yet, even though they're bird brains, God cares for them. He also cares for you. Oh, you of little faith, you're of more value. Everyone say, I'm a valuable well, I meant I'm valuable. That was just a mess up. Everyone say, I'm valuable. <laughs> You're valuable to him. You guys are actually listening. You even repeat my mistake. <laughs> you have value. You are of more value. You are of more value. You are of more value than many sparrows. Not one of them is forgotten before God. You are valuable. To walk around saying, oh, I'm just a piece of work. Ephesians 2.10 says, no, you're his workmanship. Change the rhetoric a little bit, the syntax. Not, oh, I'm a piece of work. No, I'm a workmanship. In the New Testament, in the present tense, Paul never refers to his readers as sinners. He refers to them as saints. He doesn't say to the idiots at Corinth, Ephesus, and Philippi. He says to the saints. <laughs> and so you go from a B apostle to an A apostle, from a Saul the persecutor to Paul the preacher, from a homo sapien to a hopo sapien, from an ain't to a saint, just everything's new. You're a new species in Greek. You're a new creature. You are valuable to God. In fact, even the very way he made you is so incredible. Did you know you contain biologically the potential energy equivalent scientifically of 30 large hydrogen bombs? So next time somebody says, you're a bomb, you're like 30 actually. 
you contain the potential energy equivalent of 30 large hydrogen bombs. No wonder Psalm 8 says we are made a little lower than the angels. Psalm 8 says mankind is crowned with glory and honor. Mankind, Adam, means mankind in Hebrew. It also means dust. That's the root word because mankind com comes from the dust and returns to the dust. It says that Adam, mankind, his destiny, his manifest destiny was to have dominion over the earth and subdue it. The book of Psalms says, watch this, the book of Psalms says the earth he has given to the sons of men. Paul told the Romans, you are more than conquerors. In Greek, it literally means super overcomers. Again, Paul said to the Corinthians, all things are yours. Again, Jesus said in Luke 15, the father declares, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. Revelation 3 says that as you overcome, you will sit with Jesus on his throne. So you're not seated in the nosebleeds. The Bible says you're seated in heavenly places. And Jesus is like, I'm scooting over. I'm keeping the seat warm for you. I'm saving you a seat on my heavenly throne. What a verse. So suddenly when the book of Revelation says we are kings and priests, when Peter says we are a royal priesthood, when Psalm 8 says we're crowned with glory and honor, that we're here to conquer the earth and subdue it, when the Psalm says the earth he has given to the sons of men, every morning when we wake up, we wake up to conquer the planet for the kingdom of God. We have value, value, value. You're not a piece of work, you're a workmanship. Can I get an amen? You have value, that's why you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry, oh, I don't have self-worth. Look at how beautiful she is on Instagram. It's very hard not to be beautiful on Instagram. The filters and tricks today, it's very hard not. To. It used to be that girls had to live up to models they saw in magazines. Now girls have to live up to the own, their own Instagram profile that they create. I'm just speaking the truth. It's true for me too. It's true for me. It's true for all of us. And I mean, we're all trying to live up to something that's not real. And this creates huge value issues for us. That's why you gotta know where your value comes from. Your value comes from the Father who counts your hairs, the same God who counts the stars, the Father who knows your name, the same Father who knows the stars by name, he knows his sheep by name. The Father says you're of more value than many sparrows. You are valuable to him. That's where your value comes from. It comes from his love. So I close with this. Dr. Carl Pilmer. He has researched human development at Cornell University. He did a study, watch this. He did a study of 1,200 senior citizens and asked them the meaning of life. He's like, what's the meaning of life? This professor at Cornell University studies human development. Well, what's the meaning of life? 1,200 senior citizens. You know what he was shocked to discover? The number one thing that came up from the senior citizens was this. I wish, I need a drum roll for this. Can I get a drum roll? This is big. Here it is. They said, I wish I hadn't spent so much of my life worrying. Don't be a senior citizen, look back and say, I wish I listened to Jesus. I wish I chose not to be of an anxious mind. I wish I chose not to fear. I wish I chose not to worry. So Jesus says over and over again, do not worry. Don't be of an anxious mind. Fear not. I know you say, Ben, I'm stressed about the traumas in my heart. They're never gonna heal. The scars, they're never gonna mend. The schedule is busier than ever. The sickness isn't going away. Listen, God takes care of the grass. He takes care of the lilies. He takes care of the flowers. He takes care of the sparrows. He takes care of the ravens. And he'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. You're going to get to the other side either way. Like, you're going to get to tomorrow either way. You might as well get there as a non-anxious presence in the world. You're going to get to your destiny either way. You can get there screaming or enjoying the ride. I just want to encourage you, enjoy the ride. You're going to get there either way. So might as well not worry. Ben Corson here. Thank you so much for watching my new YouTube channel. Make sure to smash that like and subscribe button. Share this video with all your friends and hit that bell so you're notified every time a new video comes out. May the hope be with you.